Okay, well, thank you all for uh, hosting this great event. It's really great to get all of the different pieces together in this puzzle of the continuum of innovation and research all the way out to the mission programs and the scaling that's going to be happening as many of those technologies are moved out to the target beneficiaries of the Feed the Future program. So I'd like to take basically reel us back up um, from my uh, co-panelist talk to think more about the research side and how your research activities might be um, shifted, shaped, modified, um, rejuvenated to think about what it would take for your research outputs to ultimately go to scale. So the objectives are really to talk about what we mean by impacts from an AID perspective. I think you have a pretty good sense having heard the perspectives of the mission colleagues this morning. Um, but I'm going to be talking about that from a research program perspective. What do we mean by impacts from our research programs? And then I'll talk a bit about impact pathways and the next steps for programs as you think through all of these different components of what AID is um, hoping that you all can come, come together and do. So, when we're talking about the impacts, it's really those high-level uh, feed the future goals, you know, reducing uh, poverty, improving nutrition, natural resource conservation. Those are the goals of the initiative. But just how your research efforts link into those is what we're going to start to unpack uh, today. So I think the one way I want to frame this, though, is this last point, the overarching consideration when you're thinking about this as a researcher and as a community of, of researchers is that for every dollar that's spent on research as part of Feed the Future, it's a dollar that's not going directly to development assistance. So at some level, you have to make the case that the wor that, that dollar really makes more sense going to research and that the impacts that are coming from that investment uh, are, are going to be more than or multiplied out over you know, the, the simple dollar going to the farmer. So that's sort of the calculus that's always going on in the back of our minds. How do we ensure that these resources are um, you know, uh, well used. So I think, you know, what I'll do is we'll just talk about how research can contribute to those bottom lines. So we all know that research timelines are variable. A plant breeding program is really different than maybe an operations research activity that's really at the very tail end of a, um, of, uh, of a program uh, arc. There are systems that are dynamic. You know, you have a project that goes, you know, a 10-year project and you finally have an output, but the world has moved on and that innovation is no longer relevant. So we're obviously trying to avoid those kinds of scenarios, and I clearly, obviously, all of you have not really been in that situation, but I just want to sort of point out the obvious and extremes. So, we really look to the social and biophysical sciences to work together to contribute to many of the things that my co-panelist was talking about, about that importance for understanding the context, the market drivers, and all these other factors, and thinking about that as part of your research agenda to really inform the decisions you make as you shape your projects, as you learn more information, and you are a dynamic research organization moving forward learning from your experiences. So one of the ways we want to think about this is how do we use those tools as academic researchers and as um, research for development researchers to respond or think about challenges in new ways or even just to think more efficiently about what's already out there. I mean, I think that anyone who uses a cell phone in the US didn't necessarily see it as a driving uh, need in your life and of course now we can't live without them. So sometimes there are just innovations that just come out and everybody thinks that is a fabulous idea but um, maybe it doesn't fill a niche that you could have defined ex ante. So why think about impact upfront? So researchers who consider product outcomes from the beginning are more likely to yield tangible outputs from their programs. This is something that we've seen in the literature over and over again, in the patenting literature in the US. And we've seen that as researchers think about what is this thing that's going to come out of this research program, they're more likely to end up having patentable income. So it's a proxy for basically planning upfront, having something that's actually tangible and, and um, uh, viable at the end. So if we think about that in this paradigm, we think about the special challenges for research for development. Um, and we recognize that impact is a long-term phenomenon over which you have very little control as a researcher. Uh, somebody else may be responsible for working with the end users. It's this entire discussion of scale that we've just been discussing. And change is complex, and it's messy, and it's not very clear cut, and it's dynamic. And that's part of the challenge of it. So, when we step back and we think, OK, so let's just try to ground ourselves in some reality. What's, what's happening? So in a mature research and development environment, so you have an environment where scientists can develop technologies, venture capitalists and angel investors are floating around university campuses looking for the great next idea. There's a lot of capacity and opportunity for researchers to link their ideas to um, tangible private sector opportunities to, to bring that uh, technology to market. And 
you, you have a lot of ways of communicating your results. You can put your uh, materials into the scientific literature and the private sector is often looking there to see what innovations are coming online and they buy up little companies to do that. So there's a very robust environment like this in the United States where this happens all the time, um, where this information is dynamic and people are looking out for it. That's a mature environment. So there's not a lot of effort on the part of the scientists to necessarily get their widget or their new technology into the hands of somebody who could really use it. The challenge is, is when you have an institutionally underdeveloped environment, um, you, you basically have to think more creatively and the researcher takes on more responsibility for thinking through what it is that they're doing, the space in which they're operating, and how they can make the linkages. So in, in as much as there are linkages that have to be made when you're thinking about scale, who are the partners, who are the actors in this space, you have to be thinking about those things up front as a researcher as well. So you can really roll back many of those lessons learned into the research phase of your activities. So this is, um, and I, f I failed to mention actually that this is really a distillation of the work by Maiwish Meridia from the Legume Innovation Lab. And she's really thought through a lot of this and has basically taken all the PIs in that program through her Impact Pathways training program, which is essentially she walking you through the slides that I'm going to talk about right now. And so uh, she frames this as you know one of the challenges for an AR for D research community is that you have to think about all of these other factors that you can't just rely on to be functional and um, and finding out about your new technology. You need to reach out and find out what um, your how your technology can contribute to the to the needs of your target beneficiaries. So I'm basically going to run through two different scenarios. There's um, many communities who've been thinking about how to improve the agricultural um, research for development impacts and those impacts at that top level, you know, the improving uh, nutrition and reducing poverty. But what I'm going to do is just briefly outline some of the thinking that's in these document and these materials. Um, I'll give you the links so that you can find the papers yourself and then dig more deeply into the definitions. But I just wanted to sort of uh, stimulate thinking about this. So the first one is um, a very interesting paper by uh, Duke and et al. on research and development as the framing approach for their aquatic agricultural systems, um, which is one of the CGIAR research programs. The second one is uh, Dr. Meridia's work with the Legumes Innovation Lab looking specifically at the varieties of beans. So her, um, her impact pathway thinking is really framed around a very specific set of technologies, whereas I think that the, agri the aquatic agricultural systems thinking is much broader. So I think that depending on the kind of research you do, you're going to find maybe something that resonates for you um, in one of these two. So the research and development frame is really thinking about research embedded in the local context. And it, you know, they, they note the importance of focusing on how research is undertaken, the commitment to people in place, location is very important, scale, understanding the community level versus the, and, you know, the individual household level, the community level, the aggregate um, hub, you know, where many communities in an area. So they're thinking about how all these different scales affect the way you might um, roll out a research program. The participatory action research approach, uh, a gender transformative approach, uh, learning and networking, recognizing it's a dynamic system. You have to learn from your, um, the findings of your research and, and what you're learning as a community as farmers become more savvy and more um, uh, creative with the, the technology they, they encounter or they interface with that changes the, all the opportunities. And so the entire dynamic innovation system is, um, is something that you have to really wrap your head around and really get into um, to think about how technologies can evolve and transform and really meet the needs of farmers. So of course, they highlight partnerships as being very important. Again, that's important in the, in the development of the research technology itself, but then also down at the scaling end capacities needed. Uh, they also note that sometimes this is a change in mindset. And so it requires not just, uh, you know, I, I think we were talking about training as being one of those important things. It, it requires the researchers to, to also adjust to new technical skills and personal skills to cultivate an opportunity to understand the perspectives of the end user and um, new mindsets to undertake research in this way. It is a bit of a shift, particularly for biophysical scientists who've really framed their research questions in very circumscribed ways, but haven't necessarily um, taken, you know, haven't ever taken a course on how to do a how to run a focus group. That's a really important skill, and there are social scientists in this room who can help you do that. So part of the beauty of these kinds of research networks is the ability to tap into all the different types of skills that can help you really contribute to um, a broader research agenda that achieves many of the, the goals that we're set out to do. So basically just the how is really the, the key here. It's how we do the research. That That is in itself. We are, we are not objective scientists. We are subjective in a sense. We are in it and we're a part of it and we're doing it together as a group. So um, 
that's sort of in a nutshell, the research and development, and there's a great paper that distills it, and then they had a conference on this and have teased out many parts of it. So I'm happy to give you the website, and that'll really just launch you into that entire literature, which is very helpful. So this is my wishes, uh, simplified view for um, her perspective on the Legume Innovation Lab technologies that are developed. And it's really thinking about inputs, so that's the research activities, the outputs, which are the technologies, the variety you develop, some type of adoption that comes in, which leads to an outcome, which then leads to impacts, and the impacts being those high-level objectives um, we talked about. So here's a definition of terms. I'll just run, I'll just skip over it because I think you can kind of grasp what that is. But this is an important uh, um, figure because it, she really just illustrates that the research outputs generated. This is the part the researchers are really responsible for. All of the other stuff is not really their responsible responsibility per se. It's not the PI's responsibility to do all those other things, but they may want to. But their responsibility is in that partnership dimension, figuring out who are all the other actors along that pathway, and thinking about who would be necessary to bring in and at what point to really ensure that their research actually takes off and has value. So here are the two key take-home points: adoption and effect size. So when you're thinking about the potential for impact of your technology, it's about the adoption rate, so how many people are growing your new bean variety, and just how much more yield comes from that new variety, the effect size. So obviously, if you have no adoption, there's no impact. And if you have um, a low effect size, the benefit per unit new widget, um, and you have low adoption, you're not going to have much um, bang for your buck. If you have low adoption but a fabulous effect size, maybe you can have some impact. So it depends on how all of that is distributed, and that's where you really need to bring in your social scientists to help you ensure that your benefits are really being broad-based as you know, part of the goals of the Feed the Future initiative. So effect size adoption. Those are my wishes to take home points. Um, and I think... Yeah, I, I think that this other key message here is the, um, the fact that the, it does not mean that to do this kind of work and ensuring that your work has impact, it is not meaning that research themselves are involved in the extension and the outreach necessarily, but they're partnering with other organizations and groups and learning from those other organizations and groups to ensure that the varieties they're developing are responsive to the market demands, but also shaping that research agenda as you go to ensure that your bean variety has the you know, quality characteristics or market class characteristics that are required by the market. And that's information you can get from partners in that pipeline. So I think we could probably uh, leave it here. So basically, what to cultivate among researchers? What are we asking you all to do? Basically, have a forward-looking vision engage broadly with your partners, and think creatively about the ways in which you're going to take your research outputs and link them into these systems, <coughs> affecting adoption and improving um, the potential for the target beneficiaries to benefit from your inputs, your research efforts. OK, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. OK. To learn more about scaling and how you can contribute to this growing body of knowledge, please visit agrilinks.org slash scaling.